The gentle breeze helps keep it cool. It also helps to blow my notes around. Uh, yeah, let me grab a clip. Better safe than sorry. Nah, just one. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 today. I uh, originally had hoped to do eight verses, and then I started to compromise when I realized how long it was going to go, and then I wished to do at least five so I could bring in the verses that talk about uh, God revealed in nature, because that's just perfect for today. But I could not even accomplish that. We've only got two verses. I didn't want to keep you here uh, a long time because I didn't want to sacrifice. There's so much to say about all of these verses, and I didn't want to sacrifice that, nor keep you waiting two hours while the food gets cold. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, people, people like to talk about their accomplishments, at least most people, whether you would consider that bragging or boasting or, or humble brag or whatever. Uh, my brother and I, we message each other multiple times a week to talk about uh, exercise achievements, you know, whether that's a new personal best and something we've lifted or a fastest time in running, um, all these sorts of things. Um, I'm not, not shy about saying I finished a half marathon. It's a bit of a humble brag, though, because it really it took me like three or more hours to do it. And I think a competitive person might get it done in an hour and a half or something like that. Um, but I was happy to finish it. The last three miles were spent walking in pain, but I got across the finish line, you know, so. <laughs> and then uh, we, li we like to talk about other people's accomplishments, too. I have a, a friend who has done a triathlon. I won't embarrass him. He knows who he is. Um, you know, that's part of why um, talking about sports can be so popular. You know, we have our sports teams. We like to brag about their accomplishments. Um, something we do here at the country church um, we bring up on Sunday mornings different things that the youth have done. You know, maybe their, their robotics team has um, reached state level, or maybe in tennis they've won a championship, or um, maybe in band they've accomplished some great thing as well. We like to bring this sort of stuff up. And, you know, accomplishments are nothing to be ashamed of. Maybe we shouldn't boast and brag about them, but we also shouldn't be ashamed of them. But, you know, if a half marathon or a Super Bowl, you know, winning a Super Bowl, if those are nothing to be ashamed of, then neither is the gospel. Uh, in fact, it is infinitely more worthy of boasting in. Uh, in our verses today, Paul is going to share why he is not ashamed of the gospel. He'll give two big reasons in the two verses that we cover. And um, by extension, we can learn why we also should not be ashamed of the gospel. So, in fact, we will see Paul is just positively eager to share it with other people, as we should be too. So, I will open us with a word of prayer, then we will read, and we will begin. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that it is the power of God and it is the righteousness of God. And so, in it, we have something um, worthy of boasting. You know, our accomplishments really are small. But Lord, you are the one who have created all that there is. And your power resides in the gospel. And Lord, you are the only one who is truly good. And in the gospel, your righteousness is revealed. And so Lord, we pray this morning you help us to appreciate it anew. Um, help us to uh, not be ashamed of it, but in fact be eager to tell others the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. So the big picture in these verses can be stated pretty simply. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save and because it reveals God's righteousness. Now let's talk about the details. So just before these verses, Paul had explained 
that it was his job to preach the gospel, and therefore he wanted to come to Rome so that he could preach the gospel to the people who were there. And in fact, he has been very eager to preach the gospel there. And now he explains why he has this eagerness. He is eager, he says, because he is not ashamed of the gospel. And I think this is kind of like how in English, maybe somebody would say, I'm not afraid to tell you how I feel. And you know, if they say that, what, what they really mean is, I'm going to tell you, and I don't really care to tell you. You know, it's, it kind of has the opposite meaning. When he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he means rather, in fact, I'm, I'm quite a bit proud about it. Uh, he says this, in fact, out loud in Galatians 6, verse 14, he says, well, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so he was happy to boast in that. Uh, so he's not at all embarrassed or shy about sharing the gospel message. In fact, he is positively eager and boastful about it. Why is he so eager and unashamed of the gospel? He says, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Power uh, doesn't just mean effort. It's effective effort, concentrated effective effort, as opposed to weakness. You know, weakness might try and pick something up, but it fails to because it's too weak. Power gets it up. Um, and we are talking here about God's power. Um, the gospel is God's power. God created the universe in seven days, and it says in the Bible that he upholds the entire universe by the word of his power. Um, so everything that is um, exists and holds together because he exercises his power for it to be that way. He's powerful. And the gospel is described as God's power. And the gospel is therefore infinitely more powerful then it appears at a, at a quick glance. You know, it's much more than just words on a page. It contains the very power of God. So as I said, people can be very eager to boast about their power. You know, perhaps they can run very fast, uh, or they can lift a very heavy weight, or maybe they have great um, money or looks and power and influence in those ways. And people are very easily inclined to display whatever power they have. They're not ashamed of it. So a, uh, a world first was recently achieved by a strongman competitor named Mitchell Hooper. Probably few, if anybody, recognize the name there. Uh, it's not a sport many people follow. But uh, he's one of two strongmen that I like to follow. Brian Shaw has always been my favorite. He's a, a gentle, strong, humble giant. Kind, professional, well-mannered. And uh, interesting thing about Brian Shaw, he once uh, helped to save a life using his strength. He came upon a car wreck that had happened, and the individual inside was unconscious and smoke was beginning to fill the vehicle. And he, by his hands, took the door and bent it so that air could come out. He didn't manage to get it off its hinges, but he got it open enough so that air could come out and the person's life was saved. Um, and a lot of these, these strong men can be kind of uh, rough and crude, so I've always favored Brian and Mitchell. But anyway, this year, Mitchell Hooper managed to be the first person to complete what's called the Grand Slam, the Strongman Grand Slam. Uh, tongue twister there. And what that means is that he won four, uh, the four most prestigious Strongman titles in one year. He won the World's Strongest Man, Arnold Strongman Classic, Rogue Invitational, and he won the Strongest Man on Earth competition. And then even more impressively, he weighs a lot less than his competitors do. Um, he weighs 320 pounds. Now, that's, that's huge and muscular, you know, 320 pounds. He, he, he would dwarf um, all or most people in here. Uh, but his competitors weigh 370 or 420 pounds, so 50 to 100 pounds more than he does. He looks like the small person on the stage. But anyway... Shortly after he accomplished this, he put up a video on YouTube, and um, I didn't watch all of it because it was quite boastful, and I don't really care to see that. Um, it had all of the four trophies lined up um, beside him, and he was smiling. And the, the premise of the video, or the title of it really was, um, I'm the strongest man on earth, what now? And the premise of the video was, you know, since I've won everything, what is there left to do? And it kind of had the same energy as um, somebody swimming around in a, in a pool of money and saying, what shall I spend all my money on now? 
um, it was more than a little boastful. But you know what? Uh, none of that compares even to a small degree with God's power. You know, if, if it's amazing, according to him, and it is to me, I feel impressed by it too, what he accomplished. It's so much more amazing what God has accomplished. Because again, he has created everything in seven days and upholds it all by the word of his power. If people feel good about running a five-minute mile, um, this is a much, 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 much bigger deal. Nobody should be ashamed of the gospel because the power needed to win the strongman grand slam is uh, laughably small compared to the power of God. God made the universe in six days. Uh, do you and I consider the gospel in that way you know, as something that is great, powerful, um, something that we should not be ashamed of and should in fact be eager to tell other people of? Because the gospel is much more powerful uh, than whatever you or I imagine being our greatest strength. You know, you can think of yourself and think, you know, this is the thing I think that I am best at. This is where I have the greatest degree of power. Maybe it's in my mind. Maybe it's in my strength. Maybe it's in my looks. Maybe it's in uh, something less tangible, like in your kindness or your personality. I don't know. You probably have something that you think is your greatest strength. Um, but God's gospel is so much more powerful and great than that. And the word says that this power is directed toward, so he's directing this universe creating power toward saving everyone who believes the gospel. God directs his unlimited uh, salvation power unto the salvation of everyone who believes the gospel. And so you had better believe it is effective. Um, this is not um, going to fail. Um, it is the same power, once again, that created everything, and he is directing it towards saving. It's utterly sufficient. It cannot fail to be sufficient. And it's available to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The Jews are mentioned here first, granted priority in time, because Jesus was a Jewish man who went to the Jewish nation in fulfillment of promises that God made to the Jews. But although they're listed first here, um, salvation is available to all. And anyone who believes this gospel is just as saved as anybody else. There is no um, preference or additional reward happening there. Greeks or any other Gentiles who trust are no less saved. Uh, and then it says it's God's power toward those who believe. And that's an important qualification because the gospel doesn't negate people's free will. People still have to want it. People still have to believe and trust in it. Uh, God does not force himself upon people against their will. In the end, it does not matter whether somebody was Jew or Gentile in the end grand scheme of things as far as salvation goes. But it certainly matters if the individual believes or not uh, because God's infinite salvation power is only directed toward those who believe. Paul gives a second reason why he is unashamedly eager to share the gospel. And he says it's because the gospel reveals the righteousness of God from faith to faith. And now that phrase from faith to faith, I've, I read it a couple times. I had to think about it, look at some commentaries uh, to try and figure out what it was communicating here because it didn't make a whole lot of obvious sense when I first read it. Uh, so what is being communicated is that um, as people have faith in the gospel, so faith from faith to faith, as people are having faith, the righteousness of God is revealed. So one person has faith in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Another person has faith in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed again. On it goes from faith to faith, revealing the righteousness of God. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And that's a, that's a statement that will be fully unpacked as we go through the book, but it kind of has two meanings to it, uh, depending on context. Sometimes it's emphasizing the fact that faith makes us righteous and lives and grants us eternal life. Other times it emphasizes that faith helps us to walk in righteousness. But in both cases, uh, God's righteousness is being revealed here. Um, on each occasion, either through the faith making people right in God's sight, so righteous in that sense, or faith enabling people to walk righteously in practice, in both cases, God's righteousness is being revealed. And so not only is the gospel a powerful thing, but it is also a righteous thing. And not just any righteousness. Um, 
I'm going to draw a similar comparison. You know, people like to boast in their power or their achievements. People also like to boast in their righteousness, at least their perceived righteousness. And God's righteousness is really the only one that is true and the only one that matters. You know, we live in a very self-righteous country. You know, that statement might surprise you because you might look at our country and think, my, we, we have all of these problems. You know, your evaluation of the country is we're a wicked country or, or something like that. I don't know. And uh, certainly we do have our share of problems. Uh, there are many sinful things that happen here, just like any other country at any other time in human history. Uh, how can I say and why do I say that we live in a self-righteous country, though? Uh, because everybody thinks that they are right. Even when they are terribly wrong, um, they still believe very strongly and are, and are quick to proclaim just how correct they are. And oftentimes, you know, the most evil things are done by people who think that they are righteous. You know, in fact, it's very rare that somebody positively identifies himself as, I'm an evil person who loves to do what is evil. Pretty rare that somebody is like that. Usually they think, I'm a pretty good person pursuing a good cause, but actually what they are pursuing turns out to be a pretty evil thing. Um, you can think long ago of what happened with Nazi Germany. You know, so many of them were convinced this is the, the final solution. This is what must be done. Um, it will have good in the end. But what they were doing was, in fact, quite evil. And then running alongside that aspect of how people can be self-righteous and we can have a problem with it is something called virtue signaling. Uh, you may or may not have heard the term. You're probably at least familiar with the concept. Virtue signaling is basically what the Pharisees did in the gospel where they would, they would go around and publicly pray loudly in the marketplace where everybody could see them so that other people would say, you know, my, my, how, how good and right the uh, Pharisees are what lovely people, how virtuous they are to pray as they do. And our country has a lot of virtue signaling, uh, not just from Christians. In fact, and I, I know I'm kind of biased, but in fact, I, I think it's less common among Christians than it is among other groups. But uh, people put signs in their yards. They put um, bumper stickers on their cars. If you have a, a bumper sticker or a sign, I'm not criticizing you. There is, there is a right way to do that in your heart. You know, we, we should represent good causes. Um, but sometimes I think that it can just be done to say, you know, look at me. Um, look at the good things that I'm supporting. Aren't I so noble and just? We get this a lot from companies. You know, I, I, I think there are companies out there that, do have a moral backbone, but more often than not, companies often just jump on the latest thing um, because they think it will make them more popular. And then if there's backlash when they jump on that latest thing, then they drop it right away. Like, oh, no, 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 no. Because really, uh, they aren't the virtuous thing they're signaling. They really want money. That's the, uh, the coin that corporations are after. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of... Um, false righteousness, and then there's a lot of boasting in righteousness. But the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. You know, not man's righteousness, not virtue signaling righteousness. It's not the righteousness of men. Uh, in fact, the gospel demands that we renounce our own empty righteousness and that we cling to the righteousness of Christ instead, because we really don't have righteousness. Um, starting in verse 18, Paul is going to very convincingly and effectively make the case that uh, no human is righteous, not even one. Just like people are not ashamed of their power, and people are also not ashamed of their righteousness, although they should be, uh, we ought to be instead boastful about God's righteousness in the gospel. Uh, Jonathan Edwards once said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary in the first place. A very humbling thought. Uh, God is the only one who is righteousness and is righteous. And so God's righteousness is the only righteousness that really matters. And that righteousness, God's, is revealed by the gospel from faith to faith. So, of course, that is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, of course, that is something to be eager to share. Because as people trust in the gospel... They become righteous in God's sight. They start to walk in righteousness and practice. 
And then the real kind of righteousness, God's righteousness, um, starts to flourish and grow. Not the self-righteous virtues, virtue signaling kind. Another good moment for self-reflection, I think, here. You know, what kind of righteousness are you trusting in and, or am I trusting in? Is it our own righteousness or is it God's righteousness? Because people are, are, are often very convinced of their own righteousness, uh, utterly convinced in the justness of their cause. But God's righteousness is the only one that is true and the only one that matters. And whose righteousness are you boasting in then? Your own? or the righteousness of God. Because our righteousness in God's sight is as filthy rags. You know, it's nothing. Um, it is of no account. We cannot, in the sight of God, um, merit in any way um, because of the sin that has been committed. So two um, big things for us to think about. Uh, big reasons for us to be eager to um, share the gospel, to not feel any shame about it, to not be embarrassed to say I'm a Christian, to not be embarrassed to say Jesus is my Savior. Two big reasons. The first, because in the gospel, the power of God is revealed. So it is a infinitely powerful kind of thing. Second re reason in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Uh, it's a true righteousness, a pure righteousness, one without fault or sin. Um, in all of this, we find the gospel. And so Paul and we as well should be very eager uh, to let other people know. Uh, let other people know about the righteousness that they can have through the gospel. And to tell other people about God's great infinite saving power that is directed effectively to all who simply choose to believe in it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for saving us. We trust you. Lord, you are powerful beyond our ability to comprehend. And Lord, you direct it to saving us. So we need not worry, we need not fear that our salvation should somehow fail. Because Lord, um, you are the one accomplishing it. And so Lord, in that we boast, in that we are eager to tell others that in Christ and in faith in his name, there is great salvation, the salvation of God. We thank you, Lord, too, for making us righteous as we trust in this message, uh, imputing to us the righteousness of Christ himself, so that in your sight now uh, we walk pure and blameless. And, Lord, we thank you, too, for breaking the power of sin through our faith in the gospel, so in practice we can be that way, too. Um, we can walk in newness of life. We can do good works in your name. We can follow the good works that you have prepared beforehand for us. Lord, thank you for this rich life you have given us in Christ through the gospel. Now, Lord, we just pray that you would bless our time together as we go to eat and enjoy some fellowship. Pray, Lord, you would just help us to uh, reflect on you, talk on you as we converse. In Jesus' name, amen.